know who you're speaking to, miss. No. Who are you? What are you? Ah, you young imp. Everybody knows my reputation, my social position, the profession I intend to pursue. I know nothing about you. What is this way of life that you, that you invite me to share with you and Sir George Crofts, Prince? Look, you take care. Now, I shall do something I'll be sorry for, and you too. All right. Let's drop the subject until you're better able to cope with it. You need some good walks and a little lawn tennis to set you up. You're shockingly out of condition. You couldn't manage 20 yards uphill today without stopping to pant, and your wrists are mere rolls of fat. Look at mine. Oh, now, they... please, don't begin to cry. Anything but that. I'll go out of the room if you do. Darling, how can you be so hard on me? Look, have I no rights over you? As your mother? Are you my mother? Am I your mother? Oh, Vivi! Well, where are our relatives? My father, our family friends? You claim the rights of a mother? The right to call me fool and child? To speak to me as no woman in authority at college dare speak to me? To dictate my way of life? To force on me the acquaintance of a brute who anyone can see is the most vicious sort of London man about town? Well, before I give myself the trouble to resist such claims, I may as well find out if they have any real existence. Oh, stop, stop. I am your mother, I swear it. But you don't mean to turn on me. What, my own child? It's, it's not natural. Well, you believe me, don't you? Oh, I'll say you believe me. Who was my father? You don't know what you're asking. I can't tell you. Oh, yes, you can, if you want. I have a right to know, and you know I have that right. You can refuse to tell me if you please, but if you do, you'll see the last of me tomorrow morning. It's too horrible to hear you talk like this. You would... Oh, no, you couldn't leave me. Yes, without a moment's hesitation, if you trifle with me about this. How am I to know I don't have the contaminated blood of that brutal waster in my veins? Oh, no, no, on my oath is not he or any of the rest you've ever met. I'm certain of that, at least. You're certain of that, at least? Do you mean that's all you're certain of? I see. Oh, don't do that, Mother. You know you don't mean it a bit. Well, that's enough for this evening. What time would you like breakfast? It's half past eight too early for oh you. Oh, my God, what sort of a woman are you? One that the world is mostly made of, I should hope. Otherwise, I don't understand how he gets his business done. Now, come on. Pull yourself together. That's right. Oh. You're very rough with me, Vivi. Nonsense. Now, what about bed? It's past ten. Now, what's the use of my going to bed? You think I could sleep? Why not? I shall. Why, oh, you? But you've no heart. I won't bear it. I won't put up with the injustice of it. What right have you to set yourself up above me like this? You boast to what you are, to me. To me, that gave you the chance of being what you are. What chance had I? A shame on you. You're a bad daughter and you're a stuck-up prude. I never intended to set myself above you in any way. You attacked me with the conventional authority of a mother. I defended myself with the conventional superiority of a respectable woman. Frankly, I'm not going to stand any more of your nonsense. And as soon as you drop it, I won't expect you to stand any of mine. I will always respect your right for your own opinions and your own way of life. Not my own opinions and my own way of life. Listen to her talking. Do you think I was brought up like you? Able to pick and choose my own way of life? Do you think I did what I did because I liked it? Or thought it right? I wouldn't rather have gone to college and been a, a lady if I'd had the chance. Everybody has a choice, Mother. The poorest girl alive may not be able to choose between being Queen of England or Principal of Newnham, but she can choose between rag-picking and flower-selling according to her taste. People always blame their circumstances for what they are. I don't believe in circumstances. The people who get on in this world are the ones that go out and look for the right circumstances, and if they can't find them, make them. Oh, it's easy to talk, isn't it? Very easy. Here, would you like to know what my circumstances were? Yes, I think you'd better tell me. Won't you sit down? Oh, I'll sit down. Don't you be afraid. Do you know what your grandmother was? No. No, you don't. Well, I do. She called herself a widow and had a fried fish shop down by the mint and kept herself and four daughters out of it. Two of us were sisters. That was me and Liz, and we were both good-looking and well-made. I suppose our father was a well-fed man. 
Mother always pretended he was a gentleman, but I don't know. Now, the other two were only half-sisters. Undersized, ugly, starved-looking, hard-working, honest poor creatures. They were the respectable ones. Well, what did they get by their respectability? I'll tell you. One of them worked in a white lead factory 12 hours a day for nine shillings a week until she died of lead poisoning. She only expected to get her hands a little paralysed. But she died. Now, the other was always held up to us as a model because she married a government labourer in the depth of Fittling Yard and kept his room and three children neat and tidy on 18 shillings a week till he took to drink. Right, now, that was worth being respectable for, wasn't it? Did you and your sister think so? What oh, Liz didn't, I can tell you. She had more spirit. We both went to a church school because that was part of the ladylike airs we gave ourselves to be superior to the children that went nowhere and knew nothing. And we stayed there till Liz went out one night and never came back. I know the schoolmistress thought I'd soon follow her example, for the clergyman was always telling me that Liz would end up by jumping off Waterloo Bridge. Oh, God, poor fool. All he knew about it. I was more afraid of the white lead factory than I was of the river. And so would you have been in my case. Now, that clergyman got me a situation as a scullery maid in a temperance restaurant where they sent out for anything you liked. And I was a waitress and I went to the bar at Waterloo Station 14 hours a day, serving drinks, washing glasses, for four shillings a week and me board. Oh, now, that was considered a great promotion for me. And one cold, wretched night when I was so tired I could hardly keep myself awake, who should come in for half a scotch but Lizzie in a long fur cloak? Elegant, comfortable, and with a lot of sovereigns in her purse. My Aunt Liz. Yes, and a very good aunt to have, too. She's living down at Winchester now, close to the cathedral, one of the most respectable ladies there. She chaperones the girls to the county ball, if you please. Ah, no river for Liz, thank you. You know, you remind me of Liz a bit. She was a first-rate businesswoman, saved money from the beginning and never let herself look, you know, too like what she was. Well, when she saw I'd grown up good-looking, she said to me across the bar, What are you doing there, you little fool? Wearing out your health and your appearance for other people's profit. See, Liz was saving money then to take a place for herself in Brussels, and she thought that we two could save faster than one, so she lent me some money, gave me a chance. I saved steadily, I first paid her back, and I went into business with her as her partner. Well, why shouldn't I have done it? Oh, that house in Brussels. Real high class. Much better place for a girl to be in than that factory where Anne Jane got poisoned. None of our girls was ever treated as I was treated in the scullery of that temperance place. Or the Waterloo bar. Or at home. Would you have had me stay in them and become a worn-out old drudge before I was 40? No. But why choose that business? Surely good management and saving money will succeed in any business. Yes, saving money, but where's a woman to get the money to save in any other business? Well, could you save? Out of four shillings a week and keep yourself dressed as well. <laughs> Not you. Well, of course, if you're a plain woman and can't earn anything more, or if you've got a turn for music or the stage or newspaper writing, well, that's different. But neither Liz nor I had any turn for such things, as all we had was our appearance. Our turn for pleasing men. Do you think we were such fools as to let other people trade in our good looks by employing us as sales girls, waitresses, barmaids, when we could trade in them ourselves and get all the profits instead of starvation wages? <laughs>